What's up guys? We're back. It's your friendly educator, Lane Norton, not evil what the fitness Lane Norton, back with another educational video. And this week we are talking about building muscle on low carb diets. So when the low carb diet kind of revolution came around a few years ago, uh, there was a lot of claims being made about possibly low carb being superior for various forms of exercise since you were fat adapted, you could burn more fat, those sorts of things. And there was also pushback of people saying, whoa, 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 you need carbs for exercise performance. You know, carbs can be turned into glucose. Glucose can be stored as glycogen. Glycogen is important for exercise performance. So what does the research actually say about this kind of stuff? And what does it say about building muscle on low carb diets as well as strength gains? So, if we look at the evidence, what it seems to show is that if you're doing ultra endurance exercise, a ketogenic or low carb diet appears to be just fine for that. That is because you are mostly burning fat during those sorts of exercise periods because it's low intensity. It doesn't require tons of oxygen or sorry, because it doesn't have a high oxygen cost. And so for ultra endurance stuff, it appears to be fine. Now for aerobic endurance, it gets a little more, now for regular aerobic exercise, it gets a little bit more dicey. Uh, if you're below 60% of your VO2 max, it appears to be okay. But once you start approaching 70% or greater of your VO2 max, we do start to see uh, negative effects of low carb diets on performance. Now, I, I want to be very clear because everybody will, somebody will say, well, my uncle's second cousin's best friend's dog sitter is a endurance runner and they do low carb and they run this, this race and they hit a PR on their time and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can also find a guy who smoked every day of his adult life until he was 95 years old and then died because he got hit by a train. Okay. It doesn't prove anything. This is why we have these things called randomized control trials. Look it up. So when it gets over 72%, when it gets over 70% of a VO2 max, what happens? Well, you switch to a little bit more anaerobic systems for energy metabolism. Now, why is that important? Anaerobic means without oxygen. So it gets to the point where the oxygen cost is so great that you cannot deliver enough oxygen to the, to the, it gets to the point where the oxygen cost is so great that you cannot deliver enough oxygen to the muscle in order for the mitochondria to be able to turn those fatty acids and acetyl-CoA into ATP and energy. And when that happens, you need glycolysis. Now glycolysis is the metabolism of glucose, which does not require oxygen and actually per unit of oxygen produces more ATP than fat metabolism. Now per calorie ingested or per gram, fat produces way more ATP than glycolysis or glucose. But again, when you get to high levels of exercise, you're not worried about caloric density, those sorts of things, or energy density. What you're worried about is how much energy can you produce from the available oxygen you have. So again, glycolysis doesn't require oxygen, doesn't produce as much ATP as fat metabolism, but per oxygen cost or per oxygen unit, produces more ATP and glycogen also becomes extremely important during high intensity exercise. So the research is pretty clear in high intensity exercise and you know, over 70% of VO2 max low carb or ketogenic diets do appear to negatively affect uh, endurance, like time to uh, exhaustion uh, as well as performance. Now, what does it say about, now what does the research say about gaining muscle mass or strength when on a ketogenic diet? So far, there's only really two good studies looking at this. 
and they're both done by the same lead researcher, uh, Vargas, and I think they were a 2019 and 2020 study. Uh, in one study, they equated calories and protein and looked at 12 weeks on either a calorie protein matched ketogenic diet or a calorie protein matched non-ketogenic diet. After 12 weeks, what they saw was the ketogenic diet group actually gained uh, a little bit less fat than the non-ketogenic group, but they gained significantly less lean body mass as well. Now, how do I explain the fact that they gained less fat? Because in diet studies, ketogenic diets don't show a metabolic advantage for fat loss. Okay, well, it is possible. Did you hear my, yeah, that was weird, right? Okay, like, like you know the, the alien in Sigourney Weaver, the like, yeah, they, <laughs> So how do I explain this since in weight loss studies, we don't see a metabolic advantage to ketogenic diets or a weight loss advantage or a fat loss advantage rather. Uh, well, one possible explanation is that perhaps a ketogenic diet, while not advantageous for uh, fat loss, may be advantageous for preventing fat gain during overfeeding. That's possible. I tend to think that what is more likely is since this was a free living study, it's possible these subjects ate less because they felt more satiated on that low carb diet. Now that compounds the findings of the fact that those on the ketogenic diet gained less lean body mass because maybe they could, if they did under eat, maybe that was why they gained less lean body mass. So it was a pretty like decent effect size between the groups in terms of lean body mass gain. How would I explain this mechanistically? Well, if the calories truly were equated, uh, what's most likely, in my opinion, is that carbohydrates, while they do not increase muscle protein synthesis, they do decrease muscle protein breakdown. Insulin has a pretty powerful effect on inhibiting muscle protein breakdown. And the balance between synthesis and breakdown is what determines net protein anabolism. And so my guess would be that by including carbohydrates in this diet, uh, you're able to accrue more muscle tissue due to the fact that you're not only having an increase in protein synthesis from the dietary protein, but you're also having an inhibition of protein breakdown via dietary carbohydrate. Now, the other study Vargas did was not calorie matched, I don't think, but it was ketogenic versus non-ketogenic and they looked at strength adaptations to resistance training. And what did they find? Stand by, because I gotta, I gotta check real quick. You can edit this out if you want, or you can keep it in. I don't care, it doesn't bother me, you know. So, so they looked at uh, a few different metrics like counter movement jump, which is basically just a like a standing high jump, uh, bench press and squat. The counter movement jump didn't show any difference between the two groups, but both bench press and squat were significantly lower in the ketogenic diet group compared to the non-ketogenic group. And when I say lower, what I mean is the relative increase of each. So people in the ketogenic diet group actually did not increase their bench press during this resistance training program, whereas the people in the non-ketogenic diet group did increase their bench press. Same token, uh, both groups increased their squat, but the group that was on the non-ketogenic diet increased their squat significantly more than the ketogenic diet group. So there could be multiple things at play affecting lean body mass, it may be not just the inhibition of protein breakdown, but perhaps these people are able to train harder because they have glucose and more glycogen available during their resistance training sessions, which, you know, if you're doing like singles and doubles, that's not really going to tax glycogen very much because you can probably get by with your in, what you have available ATP wise as well as creatine phosphate. But once you start getting into like five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten repetitions, you will be calling upon quite a bit of that muscle glycogen. And so it is possible 
that since the group that was ketogenic would have less muscle glycogen, and I'm speculating here, perhaps their resistance training sessions were not as effective. They couldn't create as much progressive overload because they were impaired in their performance. And that led to a lower um, accrual of strength over the course of this study compared to the non-ketogenic diet group. Now, that being said, I need to have this important caveat because I know some of you ketogenic diet Jedis will straw man what I'm saying and say, well, Lane says you can't gain muscle or strength on a ketogenic diet and look at this guy who's super jacked on a ketogenic diet. That's not what I'm saying. You can absolutely gain strength and muscle mass on a ketogenic diet. Both these studies show that you could gain lean body mass and strength on a ketogenic diet. What I'm saying is it's likely not optimal for increasing your lean body mass. If, you're, if your goal is just to be strong and muscular, you can probably do that on the ketogenic diet. But if your goal is to be the strongest, most muscular version of yourself you can possibly be, then the current data seems to suggest that a ketogenic diet may be suboptimal for that. Don't hate me hate the data. All right, guys, if you like the video, make sure you like the video, subscribe to the channel, and please go click the links in the description and check out some of our fine wares.